everyone who has come in today for our uh, Regenerative Ag's role in mitigating climate change webinar for Earth Day. Uh, with us, we have a wonderful set of speakers here, Catherine Bedell, Greg Gunthorpe, Carrie Balcom, Christopher Baggett, and Lauren Nitschke. Uh, I'm gonna give each of these folks the opportunity to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they do and their operation. And then we'll move right into the questions we have lined up for this evening, uh, followed by a public Q&A with whatever time is left um, with whoever is still around. So with that, we will pass it off. I'm going to pass it off first to Carrie Balcom, Executive Director of American Grassfed Association, for her introduction. Thank you, Michael, for making me go first. <laughs> I'm Carrie Balcom, from the Executive Director of the American Grassfed Association, and I grew up on a cattle ranch in South Florida. We still have the cattle ranch. I've been the executive director for the last 20 years from, this, from its inception. Um, I'm pleased and honored to be with these great folks tonight. And we're going to let them talk about their operations and how they see them fitting in with um, regenerative and climates and soils. And we're, gonna, we're not gonna filter them. They're gonna talk about their operations and how they see fit themselves fitting into the bigger picture of uh, restoring uh, soils healthy animals and how they fit into their rural communities. So I'm going to let them take it from here. I have a hard time talking about this one. I've got so many wonderful people in front of me to talk. So all yours, Michael. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Greg, we'll, we'll go over to you. Oh. Uh, I guess I'm unmuted. Uh, good evening, uh, Greg Gunthorpe uh, from LaGrange, Indiana. I'm a board member of the American Grass-Fed Association. Uh, we have a um, family farm uh, and a USDA inspected processing plant in Northeast Indiana. Uh, my family raises uh, pastured pigs, pastured poultry, and grass-fed lambs. Uh, we um, direct market everything. Uh, some of our customers include uh, Chef Rick Bayless. Uh, we sell product into O'Hare to the airport. Uh, we sell some stuff to, um, Disney, we have product at the um, clubhouse at Wrigley Field. Um, excited to be here this evening uh, to talk about regenerative agriculture, uh, talk about uh, um, rebuilding soils, uh, soil health, uh, animal health, and all of the other topics on Earth Day. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Greg. Pass it over to Catherine. Hey, happy Earth Day. I'm Catherine Bedell, and I am in Grand Junction, Colorado, which is on the far western side of the state. I think I'm the furthest west speaker we have this evening, so I'll be talking more about regenerating sort of arid lands. Um, I have a, had had a grass-fed beef business from 2004. I still have that business, although it's just me now, so I've downsized quite a bit. And I spend a lot of my time consulting with other ranchers in the area, moving them into a more regenerative future. So, um, and I spend a lot of time writing grants to help them do that. So nice to be here this evening and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Catherine. Pass it over to Lauren. Uh, hi, good evening. Happy Earth Day to everybody. I'm uh, Lauren Nitschke and my husband and I run Basically, what used to be a family ranch, uh, plus a little bit extra that we've bought since then, uh, we do only grass-fed beef and have been doing it for exactly 20 years. So um, he's been involved in the ranching business with his dad or in, in the, in the, I guess, the day-to-day -day when he was a young guy and uh, never got into the business side of it. We had separate careers in Dallas that were in very much non-ag-related uh, proceed. Um, uh, first, what am I trying to say? <laughs> um, we did non-ag stuff. We were in the design business. And uh, so running a ranch was something new to us. And we knew that we wanted to do something very different than conventional because we were living in Dallas and we knew that there were other, you know, just other available ways to get meat. And we were just very fortunate to um, run into uh, some people that were starting the American Grassfed Association in 2007 and in Austin. And Carrie, I don't know if you were there or not. I sh I'm assuming you were. Uh, but my husband had a chance to talk to some people in Texas who were putting together a co-op for uh, the Southwest region of Whole Foods. 
And he, they came up and looked at us and said, you know, you've got the quantity, you've got the grass, you've got what we need. And um, would you, would you come into our program? And so we, we did. And part of that was getting certified by American grass fed association as certified grass fed and getting at the time it was animal welfare approved uh, for our animal welfare protocols. And so I think we were actually the first animal welfare approved ranch in the state of Oklahoma, maybe also in Texas and one of the very first AGA certified ranches uh, as well. So it's been, it's been a great ride and we, we kind of built on the Whole Foods name, but we also built a, a direct to consumer market primarily in the Dallas Fort Worth area and have expanded that into Southern uh, or Northern Texas. And we'll soon expand into Oklahoma as we are able to transition to a brand new USDA plant 20 miles from our ranch. It is like we're, it's Christmas. <laughs> it's Christmas <laughs> waiting for that to happen. So market demand has been huge for the last uh, three years and we're just really excited to be able to expand. So we've been doing regenerative practices the whole time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. I appreciate that. Pass it over to Chris. Um, sure. I'm uh, Chris Baggett. Uh, we have Tyner Pond Farm here in central Indiana. We're about 25 miles east of Indianapolis, which is super fortunate for us. Um, with my wife and our son, Jim, uh, and a bunch of other people, we farm around 550 acres, um, mm -hmm. grass-fed beef, pasture-raised chicken. Um, we used to be in pigs. We now buy pigs from uh, neighbors. And what else? Um, yeah, we've been doing it for about 12 years. And uh, we sell direct to the consumer. Um, you know, Greg Grunther rolls off my my lips almost all the time because people, you know, from restaurants and things like that, hey, will you sell to us? And I'm like, no, I never want to compete with Greg Gunthrop in that space. So, you know, we chose early on to go directly to the consumer and, um, you know, we deliver, we don't ship, which makes our business kind of unique. Um, and I'll stop there. Chris, somewhere along the line, I want you to talk about the cluster truck. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. Well, we'll get right into the questions for today. Um, again, I appreciate everyone coming in mm -hmm. and uh, with the speakers that are here, feel free to chime in on any questions that you feel you want to answer. If it's something that uh, you don't feel that you have the words coming to you for, that's absolutely all right too. And please don't worry about the order. Just feel free to chime in um, as you as you feel appropriate on each question. Uh, so first of all, first off tonight, it's going to be, how does regenerative agriculture differ from traditional farming practices in terms of carbon sequestration, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and its environmental benefits? <laughs> all right. Um, you know, primarily there's no tillage, right? I mean, rule number one of regenerative ag is ground cover all the time. And that's obviously going to have benefits because photosynthesis, which we all learned in fourth grade, takes carbon out of the air and puts it into the ground. And, um, you know, secondly, it filters and allows you to, you know, stop runoff and erosion and, of course, sequester more water as well, which is in this day and age really important. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just going to chime in here. Out in the arid west, we also talk about the heat buildup of bare soil. So when you have your soil bare, it gets much warmer, which is a real problem. Grand Junction tends to be in the 90s and goes over 100 in the summer. Um, and I'm determined that part of that has been um, contributed to by the desertification of our area. And so the soil cover for me is really important to sort of stop that um, heat buildup. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, the way that conventional farming happens in our part of the world is, you know, they till everything and they leave the, the soil bare during the summer. It gets, you know, way over 100 here. And we have very dry months in the summertime. And, you know, you can just, you can see heat radiating off the bare soil. It's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. And you just realize you're sterilizing that soil. You're compacting the soil. You're putting in this, you know, pan of, water runoff that's just gonna you know we we have a big creek that runs through us and it's just always filled with red dirt mm. always to to me michael it's uh it's more than just uh carbon sequestration and the um environmental impacts of that uh carbon 
Uh, to me, it's a, a whole bunch of uh, factors, and I, I like to lump them all in, uh, to a category, especially in the um, biodiversity, all the way from the um, uh, smallest uh, cells in the soil uh, to our um, rural communities and to our um, nation and our um, planet. You know, the, we've got uh, more than just the carbon cycle. Uh, you know, we've got the water cycle, uh, right. you know, what an inch of uh, water um uh is you know for each one percent of organic matter we can hold another inch of water so we're impacting the um, uh, water cycle also we're impacting the nutrient cycle because of uh, ruminant animals and those forages going through the animals uh making those nutrients more available to uh the pasture uh you know we're impacting the um biological life in the soil uh, we're impacting the activities in the community. Uh, we're impacting the health in the um, of consumers. So to me, it comes back to uh, not just the emissions, but it comes back to the cycles and also to the um, biodiversity at the cell level to the macro level. Thank you so much, Greg. And um, I think this this next question I think really speaks to you, at least in in, in my understanding of your story uh, during the pandemic, really being able to uh, to keep things going and ramp things up in terms of uh, when we were all struggling with the supply chain. Uh, the next question is, how can American family farms implement regenerative agriculture practices to make to improve their economic viability in their operations as well as the resilience of their operations? <clears throat> um. Oh, Lauren, did you want to go? Or you want me to? Can I answer that first? Okay. I really that. don't feel like I'm <laughs> anything else when you talk, Greg. So. <laughs> oh, 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 sorry about that. I don't want to um, <laughs> step on anybody's toes, but uh, you know, you're the smartest I, I man think, in the room. So right? no, <laughs> no, no, definitely not that. Uh, but you know, I I think that um, I, I look at a couple things in that regards. I look at you know um, regenerative agriculture. You know, we used to talk about sustainable agriculture. We talk about uh, local food. Um, I think uh, when you get all said and done, uh, I, I still would argue that it's not an easy way to make a living, uh, but I would argue that we create an awful lot more opportunities uh, for the next generation. It's extremely difficult for someone to get into commodity agriculture. It's not easy to get into regenerative agriculture, but it is easier and it creates a true um, pathway to be able to um, farm. And uh, also, you know, then I'd like to talk about the resiliency, the, you know, uh, the average American consumer got to kind of see behind the curtain um, at the beginning of the pandemic and see that while there's an extremely productive and efficient uh, industrialized food supply, depending on how you define efficiency, um, it's not resilient at all. And a bunch of small farmers coupled with uh, smaller scale processors is an extremely resilient um, system. Mm -hmm. There, there's some flexibility in that system, and you know, the we as a society um, should probably pursue some systems uh, that ensure we have uh, food when it's needed. So, um, you know, and uh, just one other comment, uh, um, you know, the um, regenerative agriculture farmers uh, work together really well. Uh, you know, we lost most of our um, restaurant customers. Like, like you flipped a switch and they closed at the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, guys like um, uh, Chris um, Baggett, uh, you know, they had a bunch more customers because individuals couldn't get food anywhere. So, um, you know, farmers work together. Um, you know, Chris was a really good customer at the beginning of the pandemic because we was helping him out, um, you know, and he's helped us out too. So it's, you know, farmers working together, regenerative is about cooperation more than competition. Yep. I just want to add something about changing to regenerative practices and people always are a little afraid of change and you'll hear arguments that people will say, you know, well, my production will go down. I can't afford to lose money while I change my practices. There's all sorts of excuses of why people don't change to regenerative agriculture, but um, you can make little changes that start to impact your your um, bottom line that don't cost you anything. I mean, I think one of the first changes I did on my public lands was simply moving the salt and water sources around the land to move the cattle. Um, mm -hmm. We're on a large landscape. We're putting fences and electric fences weren't 
wasn't applicable, but we could sure move the salt and shut off water sources and make the animals move to a new area. So that was a really easy and expensive change that really changed the productivity of our land and saved it a lot during the drought. And so when I go out and talk to, in my consulting business and go talk to other ranchers, some of the ranchers out here are on massive landscapes. And so, you know, making some drastic changes can be scary and expensive and they worry about, you know, damaging their bottom line in the short term, even if they know it'll prove it in the long term. But they can do little changes like the things I've talked about and really, really do something, really make some changes to their, to their productivity on their land. Yeah. I mean, I think we have to realize that it's not a, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon and we will constantly learn and we will constantly improve. And we'll, you know, we observe, we are, you know, we're out on the land. We're not just stuck in a truck uh, somewhere. Just, I don't know. It's, it's so much more, it's so much more hands-on, I think. And it's really more gratifying to be involved with the land and involved with the animals than it is to, you know, just sit in a tractor all day and farm. And, uh, you know, we are, we're forced to get in there and interact with what's going on in nature, you know, with what's under the soil, what's on the soil, what's growing in the soil, uh, what the, what the animals are eating, what they're not eating, you know, what their needs are. And, you know, the industrial agricultural system just doesn't allow for that level of uh, interaction. And I think gratification of our own psyches to, to, you know, to work with nature, to work with nature. And I'll just finish with, you know, the internet just creates this amazing opportunity for us. Um, you know, Chris Anderson, 10 years ago, he started the TED Talks, but he came up with this entire theory of the long tail, right? And his first example of the long tail was, was music. And, you know, 15, 20 years ago, maybe longer, I'm, you know, years are going faster for me, but, but, um, you know, if you wanted music, you only had a choice of essentially what you heard on the radio, curated for some by someone else, controlling what you listened to, um, and then going to Best Buy, and you had a choice of like 5,000 songs, 15,000 songs maybe. You know, along came iTunes and now Spotify, and now you have the choice of millions of songs. And once people started streaming music instead of buying CDs or records, you know, that opened up this gigantic opportunity of choice for the consumer. But the other thing it did was it created this amazing opportunity for bands, right? 25 years ago, you were Taylor Swift or you were playing in a Holiday Inn or you were done with music when you were 25 years old. Now, you know, there are $10 million bands by the hundreds of thousands because of the long tail. And you, you extrapolate that into buying food. Well, Kroger curates my food, right? Safeway curates my food. They tell me what I can buy. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm buying online, I don't have to go to Kroger anymore, right? So it's incumbent on we farmers to get in front of those consumers and say, yeah, buy your toilet paper from Kroger, buy your meat from Tiner Pond Farm, buy your vegetables from, you know, people who support your ethics. So, you know, this is, and I think we're going to talk about the consumer in a little bit, but, you know, just the internet has broken this thing wide open where, we don't need anybody but the consumer, right? We can target them directly. Yeah, agree. Thank you all for your answers. Uh, next, we're gonna move to, um, you know, and I know this carbon sequestration and biodiversity, obviously these are all small pieces of, <clears throat> of the puzzle when it comes to um, why we're talking about this. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, do you mind, can you share some specific examples of how regenerative agriculture practices have contributed to carbon sequestration, biodiversity, and, and, and more than that on your farms and ranches, and how you quantify or measure those results. We're kind of in a world where we live by the rainfall, and, I, and you probably are too, out in Colorado. Um, it's, it's like, you, as my husband says, everybody's a genius when it's raining, because everything looks great. You know, you've got forage, you've got you know, insects, you've got all the things because there's, there's water in the soil, but when it gets really dry and you still have a great stand of forage, then you realize it's working. You don't have to go out there and measure anything. You can just look and see that, you know, your, your forage is, is, um, it's healthy and it's prolific. And to us, that's, that's one of the best measures. And then also the fact that, you know, you have insects, you have birds, you have bees, you have, um, 
you know, wildlife happening. You have deer that eat on your pastures that don't eat on your neighbor's pastures because it's full of chemicals. So that's that's kind of our our markers. It's just what we see out there. Um, I would say that the easiest um, markers to evaluate would probably be uh, soil organic matter and then uh, quantity of um, plants. So the biodiversity, those are probably the easiest to measure. I would say if you wanna really go down the rabbit hole on measuring, I would highly recommend everyone listen to the um, this past week's um, Herd Quitter podcast uh, where they had the um, savory uh, ex uh, guy explaining their EOV system. Cause I think that's probably uh, gets us to the actual data and the scientific uh, numbers on where we're at. But, uh, you know, and then the other thing I'd recommend, take a look at uh, Dr. Teague's work uh, when he was at Texas A&M. He did about 30 years of uh, data, um, getting really into the weeds, um, no pun intended, but getting into the, um, to figure out what the data is on actually sequestering carbon. And, you know, it's highly correlated to organic matter. Um, and then the, um, you know, it ends up being correlated to the, biodiversity of plants that you got on the farm. I don't really have anything to add. I look at my ranches and the, the properties that I manage. And again, it's the, the wildlife and the insect life that I see on them um, is super important to me. And, and again, keeping the soil covered. And so my pastures usually have a lot more litter on the surface when I'm done with them. I make sure, you know, we've been in the West here, we've been in a drought for probably 20 years. And so your stocking rate and your usage of the land is super important to make sure that it has what it needs to thrive even in a drought. And again, that's, you can tell that you have good water absorption and retention by your pasture being greener and greening up sooner than anyone else's even in a really dry situation so mm -hmm. um so that that you can visually you can see a lot measurement is really good to back up what you're seeing but when you get experience looking at it you don't really need to do a lot of measurement unless you're trying to get carbon credits or something like that and just to chime in you know we look at stocking density you know how many animals we can feed our stockpile in the winter how less how less hay <laughs> how much how many fewer bales we have to buy every year um you know two years ago we spent one hundred fifty five thousand dollars on hay last year we spent fifty five thousand dollars on hay hey. um, so yeah i mean it's <laughs> you know so we see it that way amy's been um going through a, a holistic management program and you know uh, we're wrapping our heads around eov um um, ecological outcome verification, but you know, for us, it's really about how many pounds per day can we put on these animals in the same acre, you know. And where we are, we're very, very fortunate to have a super humid environment, um, so the grass grows. But we're taking over corn and soybean fields that are dead. Like it takes years. Uh, mm -hmm. When we first started. Um, farming. There's a farm in Indiana as well called Seven Sons. Maybe a lot of you know them. They're unbelievably great people. And they were looking to buy cattle. And we're like, yeah, hey, we've got grass-fed cattle. Come on out. And they came down. This is our first year. And they looked at our grass, like, like literally stepped foot from the driveway to the pasture, never saw a cow and said, no, <laughs> your grass is not good enough. Um, and they were really nice about it. And we learned a lot from them. But, you know, that's really how we gauge how we're doing well for the earth is how healthy our animals are. So regenerative agriculture, good for the planet, good for communities, uh, good for the animals, good for the environment, obviously. Um, a lot of people want to get into this or getting into this. What are some of the potential challenges and barriers that family farms might face in transitioning to regenerative ag and how can these be overcome? I'll, I'll go first, I guess. But, um, you know, it starts with the customers, right? I mean, we are, if you're going to be direct marketers, you have to be a good marketer, right? It has to be a priority and it's super time consuming. Um, you know, I spent half my day today while Amy was out in the field um, in front of my computer scheduling Facebook posts for the next week. You know, like that's the kind of thing you have to do 
Um, because again, it has to be economically sustainable um, in the first place, right? I mean, that's we always say that's the first rule of sustainability is nothing happens if a customer won't buy that hamburger. Um, so, you know, it really, you've got to put on a marketing hat to be successful at this in the way we're doing it direct to the consumer. You know, it's funny here. Um, we do mostly flood irrigation and furrow irrigation. And everybody said you could never do no-till because the water will not go across the land after a couple of years, you know, no-till and grazing it, putting livestock on it. You have to recrease, recrease it and refurrow that ground. Until we had a couple very inventive young gentlemen come out with a no-till seed drill and they refabricated it so it would actually cut the forage that was going down into the creases and the water would go along. So it does take mm -hmm. some, um, you know, some knowledge of what you're trying to do and to think outside the box. It's like if the equipment to do what you need to do doesn't exist, um, change the equipment. And, you know, mm -hmm. most ranch guys that I knew are good welders and they just thought about it and, and changed their equipment a little bit, which I thought was. And so now we have a really thriving no-till um, practice here and those same gentlemen are lecturing you know around the area and bringing more people on board they have a consulting business so it's kind of exciting that the young people are stepping up and moving the needle a lot in our area yeah I think some of the barriers that we see around here are just people are just very set in their ways and they think that you know that that's really the only way they can make a living at it even if they're barely making a living and, you know, you just have to be very adaptable and realize that um, you need to grow forage. And sometimes when you make that transition into regenerative agriculture, you're still going to have to use some synthetic fertilizer because you have to have forage or you don't have animal health. And, you know, that's, I guess that's something that most people who, who think they are going to transition, they're going to have to give up all of their practices immediately. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, if you've got Forages that are have they're addicted. They're literally addicted to synthetic fertilizer. You can't just go cold turkey. You know, <laughs> you may have to go back in with a little bit of that just to keep your forage up to where it needs to be, or else you're going to be buying hay. And you know that's not going to be a very appealing alternative to most people who are already growing some grass. So, um, you know, just not being rigid and being being flexible as you transition into it is is big and it's uh, it's not like i said before it's not a it's not a sprint it's a marathon so you implement small steps along the way which is what we did and continue to do because there's still places on our ranch that are low don't drain well and you've got to do um you know some creative mitigation to get those those places in better shape where you can feed animals on it so i would just say that it's um, you know don't be rigid um, I, I would say that, um, I guess for me to answer that question, I would probably break it down into three parts because I think all of us, whether we're the person doing it or whether we're subletting that out to someone, mm -hmm. all of us in our business have, uh, production, uh, processing and marketing. Um, and I think from the, um, production standpoint, I think the, um, uh, you know, there's some, uh, huge learning curve, uh, for regenerative agriculture. And I think the learning curve revolves around, you know, depending on your climate, understanding your grass, you know, in the upper uh, portion of the country, uh, cool season grass, we're going to see 60 to 70% of our uh, grass growths in the next uh, two to three months, um, you know, and then it's going to slow down in the summer. Um, it's going to pick up a little bit in the fall and then it's not going to grow at all for um, three months. And you know the first and foremost uh, to make a regenerative ag successful, uh, you have to have a um, livestock um, species has to be matched to nature. So you know on our farm, uh, that's um, grass-fed sheep, that lamb now. So our lactating females uh, have the highest nutrition requirement of the year, are on the best grass of the year, and then we're selling off our young ones. Uh, before the winter season when we don't have any grass. But, you know, understanding grass growth is a huge learning curve. Understanding animal husbandry is a huge learning curve. Uh, on the processing side, uh, you know, for the direct marketers, it, the challenge is finding a processor and figuring out how to work with a processor. Uh, 
uh, that, you know, we're, we really need to rebuild the processing sector in the United States for small farmers because it largely didn't exist before this whole direct marketing movement started. For the actual processors, uh, you know, there's a technical uh, um, support uh, that's somewhat lacking, but it's getting a lot better. Um, access to capital um, and then commitment on behalf of the um, uh, customers is probably the biggest problem for the actual processors. You know, we haven't seen it since the pandemic, but before the pandemic, you know, lots of the processors got slow, um, you know, late winter into early spring and then would lose their help start over with a new crew every year. And then the customers would complain because the new crew didn't understand how to cut their product, didn't understand how to label it. It was like a big vicious cycle. And then those people would head off to another processor and that processor had the same problem. So like I said, we need to rebuild a professional committed processing sector. And then the marketing, just, I, I won't say much on that, but Chris is absolutely right. Uh, you know, the success of the business ultimately relies on the ability to tell your story and connect with the consumer uh, that um, is willing to pay the prices that you need um, for the product and is loyal to you. Thank you, Greg. Um, and it seems like we've done a good job identifying some of the barriers that are in the way um, for folks looking to transition into regenerative ag, but what can we do about those? What, what can we do to encourage and support broader adoption of regenerative ag practices um, across our nation? And um, I see a lot of talk about the farm bill here in the chat and this might be an excellent opportunity to talk about that well i don't know anything about the farm bill um i really don't um but there's a great book i read a few years ago called in meat we trust and you know the the woman basically traced the meat industry in the united states practically to the mayflower um and everything is always consumer driven or marketer driven, right? The other white meat and, you know, lean and all of that, you know, you know, and the farmer is going to respond to where the money is, right? There's, you know, I, I kind of came into this on a Michael Pollan kind of coattail, you know, and looking at the farmer as maybe the enemy of what we're trying to do. And I learned quickly that these are good people trying to make a living and selling corn and soybeans in Indiana is a sure thing. It's going to come off my farm. I don't know if it's going to be $7 a bushel or $12 a bushel, but it's leaving my farm. And, you know, when you do this, um, it's a lot riskier. So, you know, to me, the biggest impetus has to be on the consumer and, you know, that's up to us. You know, we started with processing a beef a month, now we're up to three a week and we still, we're out of hamburger. Go to my website right now and there is no hamburger, which I never thought I'd see the day. We used to stockpile hamburger. Um, so, you know, the more that there's consumer demand, the more farmers will do this, right? So consumer education in my world is the most important thing. So there's been, sorry, do you wanna go ahead, Lauren? No, go ahead. So there's been a lot of chatter out here. Um, the BLM has started some rulemaking regarding giving conservation equal footing with other uses on public lands. It's a draft rule. Mm -hmm. And so um, most of our public lands grazers are a little worried about this. What it would do would be allow these the conservation groups to lease the land for 10 acre parts and do conservation projects on it, excluding other uses while they work on regenerating the land. And my first thought when I saw that is like, how do you regenerate land without livestock grazing on it? So right. um, <laughs> so that's a red, like, you know, red lights going off, bells ringing. It's like, uh-oh, somebody doesn't really understand how you regenerate landscapes um, that have been degraded. Um, you can't just remove the the, the livestock grazing operations from it because you're gonna run into problems, not to mention wildfire problems that we have drastic problems with that in the West. Um, so, so spreading it, I think we need, uh, you know, people have to, we have to educate our, our leaders. I think people don't understand what we're talking about or regeneration. Um, and they don't really understand about um, sequestering carbon. It's like, I have heard people saying that 
you know, these monocrop corn growers are sequestering carbon. And it's like, yeah, but only while the corn is growing. And as soon as they plow the ground up, the carbon leaves the soil again. So it's kind of, it, people just don't see the whole big picture. So there's a big education problem. Um, also, I think on some of these larger landscapes, we have to incentivize some change because um, change is expensive, change is scary. So how do we get you know, larger groups or larger um, farmers and ranchers to move forward? It's tough. Yeah, and I think we have to be very public about our success stories. I mean, not to brag, but to be you know, document it, put it on social media, you know, show where we've got forage that's growing, that's, you know, out, outperforming our neighbors. I mean, and just not to, to belittle them in any way, but just to say this works, this works. Um, you know, when we have customers, when we have a good, strong, direct uh, sales market, you know, to shout our, you know, toot our own horn a little bit about it too, because I mean, that's how people learn that this will work is when they see us saying this will work and here's the proof. So Otherwise, I think it's just, you know, pie in the sky and somehow we have another job and that's how we make our living. Um, Michael, to quickly answer your uh, question about the um, farm bill and that, um, uh, I just want to say that um, I've spent a huge amount of my time and resources uh, since uh, Clinton Glickman area. I served on the USDA Small Farm Commission I've uh, done a lot of policy and advocacy work since then. Um, I firmly believe we need four things if we're going to um, uh, change uh, local and regional foods. And I think that those are, um, we need subsidy reform because industrial ag, the corn, soybeans, the cotton, uh, those guys get huge uh, direct and indirect. So they get uh, um, revenue insurance that subsidized 62%. We as taxpayers pay and they get huge direct payments and guaranteed prices. Uh, we can't compete against that for land. Um, land access is a huge problem uh, before you start talking about land cost. Um, we need antitrust enforcement. Uh, the um, uh, little processors, um, small distributors, uh, small uh, farmers have hard time getting shelf space. Um, guys like Chris did it and I marvel at it, but uh, I, I really struggle getting shelf space. Uh, I think antitrust, um, we have monopoly um, and oligopoly laws in this country for a reason. Uh, big companies end up with too much power and end up influencing the um, government. Uh, there's a reason for antitrust laws. Um, uh, we need um, labeling reform. Uh, we need truth in labeling consumers when they're actually spending uh, money for premiums at the um, grocery store uh, need to actually get what they um, think that they're supporting. Um, and then we need some inspection reform. We need an inspection system that is uh, both accountable, but is also appropriate for um, small and very small processors because the system is currently built for the um, large guys. It's kind of an afterthought that there's small processors. I think we need those. And I actually believe that uh, this time around, and I've probably been too hopeful before, but I think this time around, um, I think because of that resiliency issue and because of the pandemic, I think we actually have a chance to get some of this uh, through. And I think both sides of the aisle are listening right now, but I'm not going to talk about policy too much more than that because um, I think ultimately the consumers decide whether regenerative ag happens or not. Got to have a market. All right. So next is, so how, how can we communicate the benefits of regenerative ag to policymakers and to the consumers that, and the public that needs to ultimately be on board for this to happen on a large scale. You know, the, the pandemic really gave us a, an assist, but I'm afraid the effect of that is wearing off rapidly. Um, you know, we are, we're going into the farm bill that can make a huge difference in that. But when I talk to legislators that just flat ass don't get it, and even locally here, you know, as I said, I'm a grant writer and I work with multiple farms and ranches over here. Um, nobody talks about ag. It's not on their, we're an ag community. It's like this town was built on agriculture and it's still its base is agriculture. But does anybody ever talk about it at economic summits or anything like that? The economic input of our agricultural lands here. It's not on anybody's front page. So um, it's tough. I, I just... 
Um, no one thinks agriculture is important and we've sort of um, gotten over the crest of the wave of the pandemic and it's not important anymore. And I think it's important that we pound on our constituents, our customers. You know, this labeling law has been a great opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't send an email or, you know, it's on my Facebook a couple of times a week. Here's the link. Tell people what you think, you know, because, you know, in Indiana, we used to have a governor named Mike Pence. And, um, you know, Mike, you know, passed this Religious Freedom Act. and and we were horrified. And, you know, I, I talked to him after that and I'm like, how did this happen? And he's like, look, these people are in my ear all day long and I never hear from you people. Right. And that was a little bit of a wake up to me. And it may have been an excuse on his part, but for me, it was like, you know, if we're not driving, you know, I don't know if it takes a hundred voices or a thousand voices. I'm super disappointed you know, if you go to the comments on the on the labeling, are there even a thousand yet? Like that, that seems criminal. Like there should be a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. So why are we all not pushing everybody we ever met to to post a comment on that? And so you know, we're you know we're the termites eating away at this infrastructure, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's one bite at a time. Uh, to me, Chris, we'll put we'll put a link to the the um, labeling um, in the chat. Yeah, it feels like there should be nothing else we're talking about right now. We have like what three weeks left of the comment period. What else matters? Like, you know, um, it just you know, I mean, because that's like our first win. Like, it's not that it's the most critical thing in the universe, but we we <laughs> collectively need a win, mm. and that will be a big win. And if we're not driving, whatever we have, 100 customers, 1,000 customers, 10,000 customers, if we're not driving them to comment, shame on us, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, for those of you, it, we're, we have a petition in front of the USDA right now to change the labeling laws uh, for product of USA. And there's some other things as well, but just we've got to change the labeling uh, regulations because if you see a little red barn on a label you think that's coming from the farm and that's not really true in a lot of cases coming from a factory or it's coming from offshore or those kind of things so Michael will put a link to the to the petition and to the how to do a comment in the chat we'd like for everybody on this call and it's uh, just keep sharing it we've got three weeks to get as many comments as we can and it's very 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 important for the for the farmers who are on this call, because they're having to compete with offshore beef and even in the government um, buying programs, they can, the government buying programs can buy offshore beef when undercut these people's profits. And these are our farmers. These, these are the backbone of our rural economy. And uh, every day is Earth Day for them. So and they're buying that and they're buying that with taxpayer dollars. So it's like, you know, we're screwing ourselves twice there. So it just doesn't make any sense. Well, and it's winnable, right? The fact is yeah. we can actually win here of a lot of things we talk about, like we're not going to stop cotton subsidies. <laughs> like, you know, we'd like to, and, you know, but this is like a, this is like the first chink in the armor of the industrial system that, that we can actually win. And, um, and we need to go all in on it. And, and uh, Chris, to add to what you say, um, you and I got to see this firsthand in Indiana you know, when the um, uh, state um, Senate Ag Committee tried to eliminate the exempt poultry processing right. uh, at the hands of big ag. And uh, they they had almost a unanimous vote in the um, Senate and the House uh, until uh, small ag and niche ag in Indiana um, got engaged. You, Hawkins, uh, Pete, um, and a few of us got invited down to the um, lieutenant governor to meet because um, they wanted to compromise because we got enough people engaged with them that they realized that we were a voice. And so we've seen it personally in Indiana. I honestly believe this was the issue that we'd get people to really get fired up and that right. Washington, D.C. would say, hey, we've got a bunch of people out here in rural America that are pissed off that we're not doing our job, that we're not protecting their interests. And so and far, we sure. haven't got those comments yet. And if we got those comments, they would realize we're a force because in Indiana, they make sure that they ask 
to see whether or not we're going to get pissed off about something they do before they do it in Indiana because they know we're watching them now. Washington, D.C. doesn't know that. And this is the issue that we could change it for that one. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. And it, I mean, that certainly doesn't affect just us. I mean, as, as small producers, we're, you know, that's, that's even big ag and people who, you know, sell into the big ag system, you know, they're, they're competing against foreign beef too, or foreign meat. Well, I mean, the cattle population in the United States is at its lowest point in maybe history of, you know, white men dominance of, you know, the continent. Um, Brazilian imports are up 500% last year. Like, you know, people are worried about the earth, like stop importing rainforest deforestation beef, right? Like every consumer on earth can get behind that. But if we don't tell them with every breath we have, then shame on us. It's our fault. Yeah, food miles comes into play, eating closer to home. And that's that's better for Earth and better for Earth for all of us. And stop shipping food around the world and start eat, eating locally will be one good thing for Earth Day and, and all the yeah. other things. So, yeah. And that trickles down to our, you know, our local economies as well. When and the rural towns are just going under like crazy, and rural counties are going under. Um, you know, it's got, we, we can be part of the, the change that makes that turn around. You know, just on that note, one of the things that in Colorado, uh, we have a very progressive uh, um, ag commissioner right now, and she's done a lot of things to really help small producers. But one of the key things that they started doing was providing money to pay for technical assistance for small producers, grant writing um, challenges. And so bringing some of the money that the federal but the federal government's been throwing at this problem to the state and to the rural areas has been really key, especially in Mesa County. You know, um, I'm thinking that now in just up in this county alone, we've bought about four million dollars of those federal dollars back to our rural economy um, through these grant programs. And it's all spent right here through the processors, you know, buying new equipment. Um, providing beef into the food banks and supporting the, the small producers by taking their cull cows at a, at a better price. So there's there has been some um, good moves in Colorado to help. They have the Star Plus program, which is a soil health problem, um, a program. Um, one of the governor's wildly important goals is having to do with soil health and conservation. So um, so there's some positive stuff going on, but there needs to be a lot more acknowledgement of the hard work that people are doing. Agreed. Thank you all. And just to chime in here real quick, in the chat, um, there's a link you'll see posted and I'll post it here again. Um, if you click on that link, it should bring you to a page that looks a lot like, let me just share this real quick. The government page. Pretty important. And you'll be able to click the comment button at the top left of the page um, and that'll let you submit a comment there on this important proposed rule to limit the product of usa label to only uh, products that were born raised and slaughtered in the united states uh, to really help le level the playing field for our american farmers so please if you haven't yet click that link go comment um, encourage your friends encourage your family to do the same and share this with them because this is a very important matter uh, related to regenerative ag in the U.S. Please. And our last question before we move to the public Q&A is going to be, what role can consumers play in supporting the adoption of regenerative agriculture practices? And how can they make informed choices about the food they buy and eat to support a more climate resilient food system? You know, I think engaging our our consumers in in this fight that we just you know spent ten or fifteen minutes talking about that's that's a good start right there. It's a really good place to start because so many consumers have no idea what we're competing against. Sorry about that, folks. Let me see if I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Continue. Sorry. 
Well, I, I just want to talk about, um, so California, Colorado, and some of the states that have mass, massive snowfall this year, um, you know, the, the mitigation to flooding is really key on everyone's mind. So that um, capacity for organic matter to act like a sponge is hugely important. And then allowing stream beds to expand and contract. So minding your floodplains right now, I don't know if you've been following it, but in California, an old dry lake bed is filling up again that hasn't been filled in, you know, a hundred years. It, but everybody knew it was a lake bed and they went ahead and put houses and farms and cotton gins and stuff on it. And now it's flooding again. I think that probably if the land had had the absorb the absorption that it had historically, we probably wouldn't have this huge problem. So, um, so just paying attention to what we can do ecologically to sort of mitigate these natural disasters is key. Yeah, yeah, and I think talking about that, that you know, you, you just everybody knows what a sponge is. You know, you know what a dried out sponge is that it's hard to get wet again. You know what a nice soft. Uh, pliable sponge is and how effective that is at absorbing water. It's like, it's so easy for people to understand that. They don't have to understand about carbon sequestration or anything else. It's just, yeah. it makes the, the soil a better sponge and we hold the water. We don't let it flood and we grow better plants and we grow better food. So keep it simple. Just keep it simple. And I think also in this environment, and, you know, we talked about this on our private chat the other day and, um, you know, to depoliticize this, right? Um, like this isn't, you know, there's perception that this is a whole foods crowd that are eating our food. And I've gone on and done my deliveries. I map our customers and like go to Google Maps to look at their houses. And, you know, we deliver to trailers. We deliver to houses with washing machines and old couches on the porch. Um, you know, there are people that care about this from all walks of life, right? My biggest inbox right now is mRNA vaccinations, right? These anti-vax people who, you know, God love them. I don't know. I don't vaccinate anything anyway. So, but, you know, we got to talk to them and incorporate them as well in the, in the conversation. There are anti-globalists that we should be talking to about globalization. And there are, you know, animal welfare people. We should be talking about animal welfare, but the end result is all going to be the same, right? We need more and more people supporting our practices of healthy animals on healthy land. I don't need vaccines because I have healthy land. Like, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, runoff into rivers because I have healthy land. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, community development. Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people will support this movement if we make it less controversial to everyone and just, you know, focus on the things everyone can agree on. Yeah. Uh, I, to answer this question from my perspective, I, I would um, uh, tell consumers that I believe there's an awful lot of uh, noise and confusion in the marketplace. And I think that um, consumers who choose to want to um, support regenerative agriculture, um, uh, first and foremost, I would challenge them to actually um, find a farmer, um, you know, to Brian Alexander, uh, Ranching Rubu, love his podcast. Uh, you know, his comment is always shake the hand of the person that feeds you. Uh, that's the ideal. Um, but I think that uh, they should be looking for uh, the correct labels on their foods. And I think that's, um, you know, American Grass-Fed Association, if they want to. Uh, um, rotationally grazed or adaptive multi-paddock uh, grazed animals, grass-fed animals. Um, I think it's uh, um, animal welfare approved if they want an um, animal welfare um, approved animal. I think if uh, they're looking for um, uh, soil and environmental outcomes, that's uh, um, EOV, um, savory hub farms. Uh, you know, there's some choices in the marketplace. Uh, they have to realize that uh, just buying local uh, is probably not always supporting uh, regenerative. Uh, Tyson is local to somebody, um, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people have to people have to give some thought to that because, like I said, there is an awful lot of noise and uh, confusion in the marketplace. And if people are going to pay premiums, they need to make sure that they're actually supporting these uh, regenerative practices. So, 
So we will open, thank you everyone for an excellent conversation tonight. Really appreciate um, all of your time and all of your efforts with us. Um, for everybody that's here participating, um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, feel free to raise your hand. There's a small button at the bottom of your screen called the reactions button where you can uh, raise your hand or just come off a of mute if you'd like to. We have a relatively small group here. Um, so I will open it up to a public question now. Don't be shy, folks. Michael, can you put the the um, podcast that Greg mentioned in the chat? Greg, you mentioned one earlier, Dirt Something. Greg? Yeah, I'm sorry, it was unmuted. Um, I recommended the um, uh, this last week, um, the um, Herd Quitters uh, podcast had the um, uh, Savory EOV um, it was a really good talk explaining the Savory EOV um, program. Um, I listen to Ranching Reboot every week. Uh, Brian Alexander's podcast is really good too. Uh, does a really good job if you listen to it long term of uh, for to get people to get their heads around what regenerative agriculture actually is and what it does. And, and if you want a really good one, it's a it's more of a it's not a is Will Harris on his, his blog out <laughs> of pastures? Um, and people should really listen to um, Will Harris's uh, talk on Joe Rogan. Uh, that one is really, really powerful. Yeah. I'm a huge Will Harris fan and a good friend of him. Yeah, they're doing some great things out there. Really, really always inspired by. White Oak Farm, White Oak Pastures, and uh, what Will's been doing for a long time, and how he did the turnaround. I mean, he made the complete turnaround from conventional agriculture that had been ingrained in his his family and his place for you know a hundred years or so. And um, he's a great success story with that. Yeah, my son and his wife were just down there to visit for uh, three days uh, last month uh, to visit their um, solar grazing. Uh, we we'll probably have. Uh, use on about 900 acres of solar farms uh, starting next spring. So we were just going to check that out to make sure we weren't getting into anything we didn't quite understand. Yeah, so creative. What else? Um, I have a question. Bonnie Weber in New York City. Please, I'm Bonnie. giving it, Mary, okay. Um, I'm giving a, a talk on Monday and uh, I have it all, you know, by local. I'm listing three farms that I know regenerative meat and one of them is a good friend of mine. But I'm also telling them the evils of CAFOs because when thinking, I'm, I'm trying to get people to act on the farm bill. I, I don't, I know you, you know, what do you think is the worst part of them? I mean, they they pollute the air and the water. And maybe you know what? I shouldn't have asked this question, but I, but I have people in New York City who really, I mean, they're they're pretty knowledgeable, well educated people and stuff. But I don't know what they know and what they don't know. And I I really think the K-folds are the most disgusting thing ever. Um, so just if anybody has any quick, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Michael, can I comment? Yeah, um, I'm going to say a couple of things. Uh, um, I, I think, first of all, uh, I try to um, stay positive, try not to talk uh, down about the other segment of the um, industry, because I think overall, um, if we talk about our positives, people are going to choose us over them anyways. But um, uh, but I will point out that um, in Indiana, uh, virtually all of our public uh, surface waters are polluted waters. Um, largely from agricultural runoff. Uh, I tell people all the time, uh, the most valuable things that have ever left farms in Indiana historically has been our kids and our topsoil, um, but also the nutrients that they're spreading from confined feeding operations. Um, uh, but, you know, the, um, the biggest factor I, I look at, and, you know, I've, always, I've done a lot of uh, um, advocacy work um, I think that economically they've gutted rural America. 
Um, you know, the um, I'm at least a fourth generation um, hog farmer. And when I was um, my son's age, there was 600,000 pig farmers in the United States. Uh, there's 60,000 today, 90% of them are gone in one generation. Um, the largest producer of pigs in the United States now is a Chinese corporation. And I'm not anti-Chinese, but I am anti uh, investments in rural America that the money immediately leaves rural America. The economic uh, research has shown that, you know, you talk about velocity of money. If it's a local farmer, um, that money circulates in the community seven times. If it's a Chinese corporation, on the first transaction, the money's not just gone out of the rural community, it's gone out of the country. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we wonder why um, economic uh, development in rural communities is not happening. It's because we've lost our independent family farms. And that's where I say we have a huge opportunity with regenerative agriculture, with uh, rebuilding local and regional food systems, uh, rebuilding uh, processing, small scale processing, uh, rebuilding the skills uh, for actual butchers, uh, developing uh, markets. Um, we have the opportunities to rebuild rural America doing that. And you know, that, that's the bright spot of it. Um, you know, there's some parts of agriculture that we ought to really shine some light on and show people about it. But I think that when we do it, we ought to tell them that there's an opportunity to do something so much better. Yeah. Uh, if Bonnie, if Bonnie, Farm Action, um, if you Google them or maybe we can get the, the link in the chat, Farm Action has a really great um, white paper on uh, confinement feeding operations. And um, we can we can get the link to you or we can put in the chat if we have time, but Farm, farm Action is a Yeah, great no, I was at their DC conference in February. Yeah, I was there too. <laughs> well, if you want to, if you want to shock and awe your your audience in New York, people who have a brain and a conscience, just Google eighteen thousand dairy yeah. cows died in an explosion. Now, you know, just the thought of that, what exploded? Manure, right? This concentration of manure created this massive bomb, and then think about eighteen thousand animals confined like you're drinking milk like i don't know how people can drink milk like it's yeah. it's it, you know any dairy product in the united states like you're anti everything that we stand for if you're even sipping milk right so you know if you were gonna talk to people like not, i mean i can't believe this isn't a bigger story someone had to tell me about it just the other day because i didn't even see it anywhere yeah. Eighteen thousand animals yeah cows like these aren't even chickens right um yeah. like that's like it's horrifying it is it is and bonnie i put a, a blog link uh in there for you as well from um uh, somebody we've been looking at wrong direction farm which sounds so funny but um he was talking about sort of the contrast between working on your land and doing industrial agriculture and there are some horrifying images in there of kfos so okay thank you might give you something to work with too and just the, the social aspects of that type of farming versus um, the way we do it with regenerative agriculture. So, right. Oh, it's horrible. USA Today has an article about the 18,000 cows and a, and a picture. Mm -hmm. But anyway, keep talking. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah. thank you, Bonnie, for and what you're in Texas. Thanks for being an advocate. Well, no offense to any Texans here, but you know, there's not a whole lot of water there. Like, you know, you're you're basically producing a liquid in an environment where there's no water. Like, how does that work? Yeah, our closest our closest neighbor to Texas is is Lauren in in Oklahoma. So right, so you know the environment. I don't know how many dairy farms you have there, but like, why are we putting dairy farms in dry, you know, brittle environments? I don't know if they're draining the aquifers or what they're doing. I mean, that's that's just shocking to me because Dimmit is not in a uh, tropical type area. No, uh, no. I mean, I'm from Texas, so I know I'm very familiar with. What's isn't like Arizona the largest dairy producing state now or something? It's it's crazy. It's I mean, it's got to be subsidies. It's got to be subsidies. Well, it's well, Colorado River water, which now yeah. unfortunately we have a lot of. No, but that's not true. The Central Valley growing alfalfa, shipping that alfalfa over to Arizona. To feed dairy cows, pumping water from the they're ground. They're not shipping it; they're growing it. 
They're yeah, growing it right there water, the, on irrigated ground. Yeah, it's yeah. They're it, growing it in the hottest environment in the country. Yeah. You know, year they're getting you know seven to ten cuttings a year using Colorado River water that's riding in a canal for I don't know how many hundreds of miles to get it to these alfalfa fields. It's the largest waste of water that anyone can imagine because not only does it evaporate significantly on the way, but they're watering in a hundred you know ninety to hundred degree temperatures. Right. And you're right, they're feeding dairy cows or they're shipping it over to Saudi Arabia to feed dairy cows there. And and to tie it back to the label integrity issue, I'm in the um, LaGrange County, Indiana. Uh, we're the third largest Amish community, 20,000 out of our 40,000 residents in the county are Amish. Um, and we have a large number, uh, I think it's still above 150 certified organic dairies. Uh, they're getting run out of business uh, by these huge confinement organic dairies being put in in these very dry land areas that we're talking about because they can skirt the um, grazing requirement. You have to have 30% of your dry matter in an organic uh, ruminant animal has to come from the animal actual out grazing, harvesting grass, unless the area can't produce grass. Um, so they uh, put organic dairies, huge ones out west, and they've ruined the organic market. Any of the organic Amish dairy farmers in our area, if they have one time that they have to buy organic feed, they quit because they can't afford it. Um, and we're losing our organic dairies because of labeling integrity. I didn't know that, good point. Yep. Do we have two questions, uh, Maria? So, Something I was thinking about, um, Greg, I heard you say it's hard to get shelf space. Just something we did in Pennsylvania, uh, the big box stores, they always want to um, stress local, right? And be part of the community. We talked the, uh, the biggest Walmart in Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania, into allowing us to do a farmer's market every weekend in their parking lot. And it was tremendously successful because I, I always think like if it's not in your own backyard, right? People really don't think about it too much, but everybody shops. And the amount of people that came and supported, but you were right there where they were buying food, it was convenient for them. And um, it, it was a huge success. I'm, I'm not sure if they're still doing it now. I've been out of the area for years now, but it's, just a thought. I mean, if they won't let you in the shelf, if they let you in the parking lot, that's a way to get your foot in the door. Um, you know what I mean? If you have like big, and we had a lot of different uh, farmers that were involved. It wasn't only, um, you know, just meat. It was also uh, fresh cut flowers, breads, all kinds of like a little market, you know, like a European type market. That's awesome. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I think an interesting opportunity is these groceries are, are um, uh, they're building their own, um, you know, Amazon has been wildly successful, not just selling their own products, but creating marketplaces for other vendors. And now we're seeing like the grocery stores are creating these marketplaces as well. So if you go online, if you go in the store and look for grass fed beef in a Kroger, which is our biggest grocery here in Indiana, you know, there'll be one brand. But if you go online and Kroger, you're going to find five or six different brands. Mm. The problem with that for us is that it's all like still national. You have to ship. Um, but as they get more local where, you know, I can target my customers here in central Indiana on the Kroger website and market to them and pay them, you know, whatever the commission is, 10 percent. Um, you know, I think those are going to be interesting long tail opportunities with the groceries. But I still think groceries are obsolete and we don't need them anymore. Don? Take you off mute there, Don. Hold on one second. Um, I wanted to go cover a couple things. Uh, I just uh, spent three weeks working in uh, Florida. They've lost uh, three quarters of their dairies in the last 10 years. I just uh, wanted to tell you that I put up my uh, website. It's called soilpower.com. And I've tried to make uh, a complete across the board simplicity uh, uh, regen site.
took me about three years. And uh, it, it's halfway decent, I think. So I try to keep it at like fifth grade level and uh, stay away from the university talk as much as I could. Still I managed to learn how to spell the word mycorrhizia, you know, like that. Anyway, uh, that's one item. The other one is uh, John Kemp, you know, that wrote the book Quality Agriculture. You're familiar with that, you guys? Probably. Okay. Uh, he came up with the idea of uh, something called uh, nutritional integrity. And I wanted to add uh, P to it called nutritional integrity product. And that would be anything you guys grow. If it's no till, it's got nutritional integrity because of the quality of the protein, uh, which, you know, nobody gets into right now. They don't talk about it. They don't know about it. Mm -hmm. But the bonding, the bonding in that uh, protein has levels. And uh, anyway, I think this idea of the nutritional integrity product would be a heck of a label for all of us to uh, look for and uh, input into. And that's coming, I think, right around the center of uh, what John Kemp is doing. I love that. And also, I want to put in a word for my favorite author, uh, guy that wrote Dirt to Soil. Maybe you've heard of that book. Guy by Gay Brown. Thank you. Thanks for your comment there, Don. Appreciate that. Um, and are there any other questions um, tonight from our attendees? Please feel free to raise your hands, come off mute. Any last questions for tonight? All right. Seeing there are none as of now, please interrupt me if I'm wrong. Um, any last comments from our speakers for the night on uh, the importance of regenerative ag on Earth Day? I just want to thank everybody for being on tonight. I think that's awesome. It's a Saturday night, Saturday evening, wherever you are. And I really, really appreciate um, people spending, y'all, spending some time with us and just having this discussion. It's super important. And my hope is that you will take what you learned tonight and you will be empowered to spread the word and do it boldly and with compelling stories and um, realize that you have the ability to make uh, an impression on other people and to make a, uh, you know, a powerful argument for what we're doing. So thank you. And I just want to tell, you know, so I don't want people to get down that we're not doing enough and that um, things have changed a lot. I mean, when you think about how long it uh, took us to get into this situation with our degraded soils and everything. It's going to take a while to fix what we've created, but we are making progress. It's like things have definitely changed. So I don't want everybody to go away thinking it's hopeless because it's really not. We are doing something. And I, every time I look around, I see more and more things that have changed. So um, just a, a word of hope. And the the folks that are on this call tonight, each one of their operations are a testament to what can be done, what is being done. So we're honored to have them. And hopefully we'll have some more of these um, and have some more voices on here. And and um, if you need to reach out to any of these people, we'll make sure that, that their information, as long as, of course, um, we're always honored to be in, in their presence and, and be around them. So uh, uh I hope you all will reach out to them if there's anything you need or anything you want. And, or, and Michael will give you the information. But thank you again for spending part of your Saturday evening with us. And thank you for all AGA does. It's it's remarkable. And we wouldn't be where we are without y'all. So thank you. Definitely. Oh, we sure thank appreciate you, it, Gary Karen. and Michael. Yep. Chris, Craig, anything to add there? Yeah, the um uh I think in some ways, uh you know, somebody even said it tonight that, uh, or in the chat that we are speaking to the choir, but I think in lots of ways, I think the choir is getting a lot bigger. I think the 10 is getting a lot bigger and I think the choir is getting a lot louder. So I, I'm encouraged by that. 100%, again, we, we cannot keep up with the demand out there from the consumer, um, which is a great problem to have. Um, but Absolutely. also, 
before we finish tonight, everyone just go and make a comment. I support this. Like it doesn't have to be a book. Just like I support this. Just make a comment on that page. Um, let's win this one. We can win it. It's right there in front of us. Just let's win. Share it with everyone you ever met in your life and let's win. You've given us a challenge. We're set. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we can do it. We can do it. All right. Thanks everybody. Really nice uh, being part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Um, anyone that uh, obviously the link's been in the chat a billion times to comment. Uh, feel free to visit us at americangrassfed.org. Um, we're always doing events like this. We're always doing anything we can to advocate for our American family farms. And um, please feel free to follow us on social media. We're uh, very vocal about these issues. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, y'all. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.